Here we've got the Bush SRP31D model and we've done the C model before in another video. This one has the ECL86 type valve rather than the ECL83 type valve. It's a lot bigger and a bit more output in voltage and uh, power terms as well. The weird thing about this record player is that you do not have a extension loudspeaker socket or any provision for that. But what they did give you was a input and a line output for recording. And that is quite strange. You don't normally see that on any record player like this. The handy thing about having an, an input like that is uh, a guitarist might want to plug a guitar in there and actually record it through the tertiary output. Tertiary output means it's going through the output transformer and you're getting the sound of the power valves as well as the whole circuitry with the tone circuit and everything else. The one letdown with this model is the actual Celestian internal loudspeaker, six inch by four inch. It could have been a bit better um, in terms of model and performance. Okay, another thing to mention would be the electrostatic tweeter, the speaker here. I've never seen one that actually works from the many players that we've seen and amplifiers. They are very unreliable. There is someone on YouTube who actually shows us how to fix them, but um, I've never followed it up and neither has Mark as yet. Mark did an upgrade on one of the players where he replaced it with a passive tweeter and put a crossover unit in there, a very simple one. But you don't have much room to toy with in the back there. That's one thing to look out for. You've got high voltage going to that tweeter, so be careful if you're going to go near it. Uh, ceramic cartridge here on this one, the ST11 BSR and the UA16 record deck. A very nice colour scheme on this actual model uh, to go with the Bush SRP series. Here's the data sheets for the ECL83 and the 86 so you can compare them. And we go over to Phil Moss who's going to take you through the circuit diagram. Bush record player SRP31D and amplifier AU31D. We've had similar units to this, but anyway, with this one there is a stereo conversion using the external amplifier for one channel. But to deal with what is on the screen, this may confuse you at first. This here is their interpretation of a cartridge, well that's fine. It's got some extra wires on it, what's all this about? Well it's a stereo cartridge and if you just buy the record player, where it says PL1, there is a link that one plugs in to the amp input. By doing that, one monos it by joining the two channels of the output of the cartridge together, and one has it as a normal record player in mono. If you have an external amplifier, you unplug the link and plug the external amplifier, which Bush made, into there, although you could use another amplifier anything that would take a ceramic pickup as the input. So the signal, either mono or stereo, or indeed you could use this socket too as an input for an external source, such as a guitar, I'm told, assuming the levels are about compatible, and use this as a guitar amp or to play a radio, perhaps a pocket transistor radio would sound a lot better played through this. So we have a bit of equalization on the input. There's a little bit of treble boost on that. We then have a one meg volume control. It doesn't say it's logarithmic, but you can be fairly sure it is. Now the feedback in this amplifier from the output is a bit on the complicated side because there are two loops. One of them here is via tone controls and that goes to the grid and to maintain the impedance at the grid fairly constant, otherwise the effect of the tone controls will vary with the volume control, there's a 220k series resistor. Because obviously when you turn the volume down the low end, there's not much of that one mega ohm resistance, and therefore it would change the loading fairly dramatically on the tone circuit. Obviously the impedance does vary and obviously that does affect the tone controls but on the other hand probably most people didn't notice. There's also feedback applied to the bottom of the volume control via this network here of a capacitor and resistor. That's not variable unlike the tone controls. 
and in the bottom of the volume control one has a small amount of resistance and again another capacitor here um, so that has an effect on tone that will decouple treble having the 0.02 across the resistor and where you have a resistor in the bottom of the volume control you can never actually turn the volume down to zero but there'll be very little remnant at the end of the travel so after all that what do we got the ECL86 is a triode pentode with a high gain triode like an ECC83 and a high gain output pentode so we've got two output valves in push pull obviously so we've also got two triodes the first one is used as a straightforward voltage amplifier plus it has the negative feedback applied to it at the same time but on the grid and not the usual on the cathode so there's very little to comment on that the signal is then fed via a capacitor to the split load phase splitter so as I've explained oh so many times before the phase at the anode and the cathode are opposite so there is our phase splitting to drive the output valves um, nothing unusual there it has a single resistor and capacitor for the bias of the output valve which now as on so many occasions I criticize because it's far from ideal if the valves aren't well matched and they're very unlikely to have used match pairs in a record player because it's more expense and people are very unlikely to replace them with match pairs either so I'd far prefer it had separate bias components for each valve um, there are grid stopper resistors, as is often the case, to uh, suppress the possibility of high frequency instability. So, the output is straightforward pentode connected with the screen grids taken straight up to the decoupled HT, it must be said. So the voltage on the screen grids is lower than on the anode, which means it does cause the valves to dissipate less power on the screen grid. So we have a tone correction capacitor across the output transformer winding because it's being driven by pentodes and there is a further tone compensation in the form of the 2200 PF and 22K. That may also have to do with maintaining stability. Now, a little unusually, we have an output for a tape recorder from the transformer. Of course, that output varies with the volume control. Ideally, tape outputs are before a volume control um, so that one can vary the volume but not affect one's tape recording. But that asks for more complexity in the circuit, so they've done it this way. It's an isolated winding which makes it safer. Um, should this not be earthed as it's supposed to be, it does have a three wire mains or the tape recorder is floating. There is our speaker, but you'll notice that there is something going on here. This is an electrostatic tweeter. It's driven through capacitors across the anodes of the output valves. So there is a constant DC bias on this provided through this resistor but the other side goes to earth so those resistors have a high impedance compared to the impedance of the anode of the valve so it doesn't see much of a load through the resistors and the tweeter is then driven um, off the anode as I said uh, it takes quite a lot of volts it consumes very little power in um, an electrostatic speaker but it does take quite a lot of volts. Now, the power supply is fairly typical of the time. You've got two fairly big capacitors of 50 microfarads. The anodes are driven directly off the reservoir capacitor. The screen grid and the rest of the circuit is driven off the decoupled circuit. A little unusually, there is no further decoupling for the input valves. There usually is a resistor and another capacitor there to keep the hum down. Presumably this didn't hum badly the way they did it and therefore they saved the expense. It has got a mains transformer. It is an isolating transformer, but they have only used one diode. When this was made, metal rectifiers were really rather expensive. Um, it would be much better if it was a bridge rectifier 
but to save money they did the half wave which was fairly typical and again to save money they've used the tap secondary winding with the heater coming off here. If they were separate windings one could probably when the metal rectifier fell over as they do after a period have put in a silicon bridge rectifier which would have doubled the ripple frequency from 50 to 100 cycles and doubled the effectiveness of the decoupling circuit so that the hum would have been twice the frequency but its amplitude would have been much lower. But they've done it the way they have. Now going back to this feedback, there's a potential divider here. So only about one third of the voltage is actually fed back at this point. It then goes into a tone circuit here. Conveniently they're labeled in case you can't work out the, how the circuit works the base pot. So there's a decoupling resistor and a decoupling capacitor which short circuits the treble. So this only has the lower frequency end of things. Um, if you turn the control towards ground then very little bass is fed back therefore the amplifier's gain at bass frequencies increases. Alternatively if from the middle point you turn it down this way more bass is fed back and therefore the gain reduces and therefore it reduces the bass. To prevent interaction between the bass and treble controls there is a resistor here in series with the output from the wiper. The treble con control works simply you've got another one mega ohm pot and a 1500 PF which is a short circuit to treble. So when one turns that towards the earth again one short circuits the treble feedback that's boosting the treble and conversely when you turn it that way it increases the treble feedback and therefore reduces the gain and reduces the treble. We're in the process of editing several videos at the moment the Dynaco Stereo 70, the Quad, Williamson, GEC MOV KT66 triode amplifier circuit and several others the service technicians are very keen to share their knowledge and their experience gained over the last 50 years. Please visit our website to become a member and offer support towards our future projects so that we can continue with this subject. We've been recently setting up a quiz interactive software for online and this will run in conjunction with each of our video tutorials. We're in the process of building the website and soon it will be automated for the membership. At the moment you can go with the emails and we can respond manually.